Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's webinar. Search is the tip of the spear for your B2B e-commerce strategy, brought to you by Lucidworks. I'm Jill Marte, and I'll be your host today. We have just a few announcements before we begin. This webinar is designed to be interactive. The dock of widgets at the bottom of your viewing screen will allow you to learn about today's speakers, download various resources, and participate in the Q&A session that takes place at the end of the presentation in Fireside Chat. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. You may also download a PDF copy of the slides via the resources widget on your viewing screen. Lastly, if you're experiencing any technical problems, please use the Q&A widget uh, or the help widget found at the bottom of your screen. We'll be glad to offer you one-on-one -on -one assistance. I would now like to introduce our guest speakers today. Welcome Joe Sisman, Senior Analyst with Forrester, and Jenny Gomez, VP of Marketing with Lucidworks. We're so happy to have you both here. Jenny, take it away. Thank you so much, Jill. Uh, super excited to be here, super excited to be talking to the audience. I am thrilled to be working with Joe uh, to talk about B2B commerce. Uh, it, it is a, a topic that is near and dear to my heart and certainly a topic that is near and dear to Lucidworks. Um, we wanted to sort of address the fact, we've noticed here at Lucidworks that because of the COVID-19 pandemic, there has been a shift in B2B commerce. And Joe talk, will talk a lot, a lot more about sort of omni-channel selling and where B2B had been in the past. Um, you know, B2B commerce, because it's bigger sales, more complex products, um, higher ticket items can tend to be, you know, it, it's not an industry that seemed as intuitive to go into e-commerce as quickly as say B2C. Um, but we're finding now that every buyer has become so accustomed to shopping online for just about everything. Why not shop online for things like, you know, auto parts and, you know, more complex component componentry and electronics components and things of that nature, things that larger uh, distributors purchase for say retailers or, or sort of manufacturers maybe selling to other distributors. Um, this is becoming just more and more common. And we're seeing that in order to just sort of really digitally transform and be successful in B2B commerce, you have to start thinking about treating your buying experience a lot more like B2C. Now, we believe at Lucidworks that search is really the tip of the spear um, when you're shopping online, right? Um, you can browse, and browse is great in the B2C environment, but generally in B2B, what, what tends to happen is your B2B buyers are going, into, are going to your website to buy something very specific. They're looking for part numbers, they're not looking for keywords, they're not like browsing for dresses or pants or new shoes and sort of seeing what they find. They wanna find exactly what they're looking for and they wanna find it fast. Um, that means that search has to be really precise and it's all about that findability and not necessarily the browse. So it actually makes search even more important on, an, on, on a sort of e-commerce site um, than say like fastest and filters might be on a, B2, on a B2C site. Uh, it's so, and B2B search can be very, very technical because customers are coming in and we call them head and tail queries. Um, tail queries are the queries that have like very complex part numbers, um, very specific keywords, things like that. B2B generally tends to be full of tail queries because you're looking for things that are very, very specific and it's not necessarily gonna be intuitively lexical as an example. So that really requires some sophisticated solutions. Um, right now we're finding that a lot of B2B customers are seeing that it's, it's hard to implement their search solutions. Um, it's difficult to integrate those search solutions across all of their touch points. There's too much manual effort that goes in, especially in B2B in building a lot of those tail queries, like too many times it's folks going in and having to manually type all of these things in, we're finding that you're really gonna need your search to automate a lot of those processes. Um, and, and B2B buyers and, and B2B companies, B2B commerce companies that are building these experiences for their customers, they really need some more robust features and sophistication because of the complexity of their use case. At Lucidworks, we're really, really familiar with B2B customers. CDW is one of our most valued customers, um, and we helped them improve their omni-channel search experience and gave them immediate relevancy improvements, which allowed them 
to decrease their zero results by 40% and actually increase um, a lot of their conversion rates, 3% increase in conversions when you're shopping for components and electronics at an organization like CDW is millions of dollars. Um, that 3% increase could really, really change the game for your bottom line, and that's just by improving search. Um, so, so we understand the complexity and the needs of this piece of the e ecosystem, and we understand that making small improvements to the search experience will just will improve the bottom line in ways that sort of tend to blow our customers out of the water. Um, so I'm actually, so I wanted to give you guys a little intro into sort of what we believe here at Lucidworks and, and sort of how we think about the B2B ecosystem. But I'm really gonna let Joe Sisman speak to the ecosystem. He's the expert, so excited to have him here. Um, Joe, why don't you take it away? I'm super excited to, to dig in and see, uh, and see what you have to teach us today. All right, thanks Jenny. Hi everyone, I'm Joe Sisman, Senior Analyst here at Forrester Research. Uh, I cover B2B e-commerce, marketplaces, and digital experience platforms. Uh, and today I'm gonna talk to you about how search is the tip of the spear in your B2B e-commerce strategy. Uh, I'm gonna put it into context to help you understand how it relates to your digital strategy so that you can understand its value. In B2B e-commerce, you don't get where you need to be if you spend money on technology without comparable investment in skill building and a network of expert partners. And being great takes training to not lose your balance, that balance between what your customers want and what your firm values. Having digital skills is important because the new connected consumer poses a challenge for brands. Digital business pros like you need to understand how your customers connect across three dimensions devices, platforms, and channels, and then map your portfolio of experiences so that you're present where your customers are. And the model for thinking through your portfolio of experiences is something that we call the 3D connected consumer. Three dimensions, devices, platforms, and channels now define how consumers are connected and brands need to serve their consumers wherever they are in these complex ecosystems. So you need to take a fresh look at how your customers connect as you craft your technology and platform portfolios. And that's because customers use combinations of devices, platforms, and channels that firms don't support. So you need to understand how your customers' digital ecosystems in order to map your portfolio of experiences to how your particular customers connect. And that's not a trivial endeavor. That's because customer journeys aren't simple and brands aren't in control of how the customer goes through that journey. Your digital experience platform is how you build experiences to support buyer journeys that are non-linear and in the buyer's control. And the talent that you employ to build those journeys, your practitioners, well, they need flexibility built into their tools because they don't have time to constantly rely on developers. Now, this isn't just about better employee experience, great customer experience leads to business growth. So for years now, Forrester has been writing about how B2B buyers are behaving more and more like consumers every day. And some of this is the generational preference of the millennials. In fact, 73% of millennials in the workforce are involved in purchasing decisions. But it's not limited to millennials. That boomer CFO, well, she's designing and ordering her new car online without ever visiting the dealer showroom. So any way you slice it, you are increasingly selling to business buyers with consumer grade digital preferences and they're levying those expectations on you. Now getting customer experience right leads to loyalty, which is retention, enrichment and advocacy and that drives business growth. But getting customer experience wrong makes things go in the other direction and that translates to pain not only for you, but it translates to pain for your customer as well. Friction leads to mistakes delays and decreased purchase confidence and that erodes loyalty. And keep in mind too that in B2B, these are your customers' jobs and you know how you react, maybe just internally when suppliers let you down or make things harder than they need to be. So which verticals in B2B will drive the most e-commerce growth? Our latest report on US B2B e-commerce forecasts that motor vehicles and motor vehicle parts and supplies will grow the fastest over the next five years at a 15.5% compounded annual growth rate. And that industry already captures 17% of its total sales through e-commerce. 
Now, the second fastest growing industry is electrical and electronic goods at a 12.1% CAGR. And this is growing off an already large base. In fact, it's the second largest industry in terms of overall e-commerce penetration. 26% of US B2B sales in this industry are transacted through e-commerce. And then rounding out the top three fastest growing industries in e-commerce is machinery, equipment, and supplies. And that's forecast to grow an 11.7% CAGR. But zoom out and we're looking at US B2B e-commerce forecast to hit $3 trillion annually by 2027. Total B2B sales are forecast to grow at 3.3% CAGR over that time. And B2B sales through e-commerce are forecast to grow at 10.7% CAGR. Now that growth rate dwarfs offline sales, which are projected to grow only half a percent over that time. So you should expect substantial, sustained growth through your e-commerce channels, and you should be investing now to capture that opportunity. But invest with an eye on the changing buying motions of your increasingly digital customers. Don't sell at them. Instead, use digital to help them through their buying journey. Today's digital buyers use digital in their search long before they contact you, even if they transact with you offline. And already today, 48% of global B2B demand and account-based marketers that we surveyed indicated that they use AI for personalization. And this helps marketers understand site visitors' intent and serve them up the right content at the right time. Personalization is a necessity. Now, personalization is defined as the act of delivering the right message to the right person at the right time and place. It's no longer simply a nice to have, but it's a necessity in B2B with 63% of the global B2B demand and account-based marketers that we surveyed using personalization in marketing and 61% using personalization in sales activities. So among the most popular approaches are personalization based on buyer need, industry or persona and then delivered through channels such as website content recommendations automated conversations and digital advertising different levels of personalization may be in play within a web property or tactic or set of tactics depending on your program design the building blocks for personalization strategy connect audience content and delivery requirements so first assess the audience you know, personalization doesn't always need to be executed at the individual or the known contact level or involve personally identified in information to, be, to have an impact. And second, use data to drive delivery. So personalization is dependent on the data available for each audience segment and the inter interaction channel defined by the program. This data fuels audience targeting, delivery mechanisms, triggered messaging, and, and automated workflows. So start with first party data that you already have in your own systems and that you captured through efforts such as online forms and digital analytics. And if no data is available, then use topics of interest to continue the engagement and promote self-identification through opt-in. And map and tag your content. So unless your content's mapped and tagged with metadata, your personalization initiatives won't make any recognizable impact on your engagement or conversion goals, even with the best technology, creative and data strategy. Now, this strategy also begins developing and training the feedback loop that drives continuous learning about audience and activation techniques to understand what's working and what isn't based on buyer and business objectives. Now, that B2B consumer we talked about earlier has four expectations of the experiences they have with your business. They expect to be treated as partners through experiences that are increasingly connected, open, intuitive and immediate. So let's break that down a bit. Connected, modern buyers will expect providers to work with them on a set of shared goals throughout the entire customer life cycle. And open, future B2B buyers will expect you to have, will expect to have access to a much wider range of relevant information, including pricing, business practices and policies, market feedback, sales channel route choices and delivery options. And intuitive, Tomorrow's buyers will expect every experience with your organization, all the content they access, all the conversations they have, all the offers they receive, 
to feel like a natural and extended, a natural and logical extension of their previous experiences. And finally, immediate. Modern B2B buyers will expect providers to be present and proactive at every moment of their journeys in all their preferred channels and touch points. So is digital and what you do with it something completely foreign? Does it erase the human element? Well, no. In fact, when it's done right, it, it can amplify that deep human expertise. Now, I think this quote sums it up nicely. The best enterprise marketing today is embracing digital at scale to do what great salespeople have always done, personalize their engagement and offer a great experience. And a reminder, it's not just your competitors you need to worry about, it's all the other digital experiences your customers encounter in both their professional and their personal lives. It's clear that digital self-service isn't the entirety of the solution for your customers. That's because they still have complex problems and they need experts to help them identify the right solution. In 2021, Forrester fielded our latest survey on B2B buying. And in the second year of the pandemic, 67% of all B2B sales globally went through a vendor sales rep. And that was higher than it was a couple of years ago. And why is that? Well, because many products aren't a fit for pure digital selling. And buyers have complicated pains that require complex solutions that come with change management initiatives. And here's the kicker. During the pandemic, when so much got disrupted, business leaders had to operate their businesses differently, and they were looking for domain expertise from their sales reps to figure out how to pivot and what gear they needed to, in order to do it. In other words, they needed consultative sellers. Now, that study also indicated that another 33% of global B2B sales went through some combination of rep-assisted and self-service e-commerce. So the punchline here is that e-commerce complements B2B sales. It doesn't replace it. And the ratios fluctuate based on what's happening in your customer's business. Now, most businesses like yours offer a range of products that offer a range of, that solve a range of problems. So you need to think carefully about how you deploy digital experiences across your entire range of products. So to get started, use this grid to segment your product portfolio. Now that horizontal line, that axis represents the complexity of your customer's buying process. For example, if one field tech can buy one replacement part, that's low complexity. But sometimes your buyer needs to get support from her peers, approval from her upline manager, and the go-ahead from the governance committee. And that's a high complexity buying process. The vertical axis is the complexity of the product itself. And you can think about this as the amount of knowledge your buyer requires. And this one is affected by the particular individual buyer you happen to be working with. Now, once your products are on this matrix, overlay these four boxes the way you see them here. These are your selling motions that you'll apply to your customer's different buying motions. So what's happening with buyers in the big picture? Well, in 2021, buyers stepped up their due diligence. Buyers exercised greater scrutiny over vendor solutions than ever before with more buying interactions and more people involved in the purchase. And interestingly, purchase timeframes remained about the same. So buyers are demanding more, but not taking longer. And the average number of buying interactions in a purchase journey jumped by 10. Now, by far the biggest shift in buying behavior was the significant leap in the average number of buying interactions from 17 in 2019 to 27 in 2021. Buying interactions are defined as any activity to obtain information about offerings or vendors, including self-guided self, self -guided interactions, mostly done with research on the internet, and personal interactions. And that could be virtual or in-person interactions or uh, conversations with someone from a provider company or, or even a third party. The number of people involved in purchase decisions continues to increase so today 60% of purchases have four or more people involved versus just 47% in 2017. Technology-based offerings continue to climb as a percentage of overall purchases, which is at say 80% today. And this is requiring inclusion of more IT roles. Many technology purchases, including software, inherently affect a broader swath of functions, departments, and business areas, which brings more stakeholders and influencers into the mix. 
So the number of people involved in the buying process is increased partly due to the pandemic. Buying groups have become the norm, requiring vendors to understand all the players involved. Now the term buyer now means a buying group. And despite or because so many buyers are working remotely, this year has catapulted the buying group to the forefront. Independent buying groups with only one or two people involved are becoming harder to find. With more people participating, more buyer roles that aren't decision makers are becoming involved. So like champions, users, multiple influencers, and ratifiers. Buying groups have become predominant. So our 2021 B2B buying study shows that more than 80% of purchases now involve complex buying scenarios, consensus in which three or more people are involved across two or more departments, and committee in which strategic purchases involve multiple people and departments across the organization and require executive oversight. Independent buyer scenarios with one or two people involved were once the easiest buying scenarios to find, making up 41% of all scenarios in 2015 and 2017, but that number has dwindled to 18% as of 2021. Digital presence is required, but buyers also want personal interactions. Now, digital presence shows up with the uh, shows up as the perusal of assets like case studies, ROI tools, and videos on the provider's website. But buyers also search for articles relevant to their industry and use cases, and they mine user reviews and online communities. And although social media has grown in importance each year, it doesn't quite rank as highly as other digital interactions. Buyers sought out even more interactions, both human and non-human. Buyers found both human and non-human interactions significantly more valuable this year than in years past. On average, the number of buyers who found human interactions valuable increased from 35% to 55%. And on average, the number of buyers who found non-human interactions valuable increased from 33% to 53%. Digital content is highly sought after. So for the first time since 2015, the number of self directed guided buying interactions has outpaced the number of human interactions. That's 15 versus 12. This slight shift may be due in part to the expansion of digital content types and the time buyers have for online exploration while they're working remotely. As a result, the consumption of content that buyers found impactful to the purchase process increased an average of 15 percentage points. So that means your content matters. Valuable content marketing demands editorial discipline. To catch customers' attention, B2B marketers first need to understand how their capabilities and resources rank among five competencies that boost editorial mastery and upgrade content marketing practices from conventional to leading edge. So take stock of your content marketing strategy, processes, and capabilities. To attract buyers' interest and engage them in a dialogue about the business outcomes they need and want, marketers should shift content strategies from promoting what they do to providing information that informs, educates, entertains, or delivers utility in the customer's eyes. Part of doing that involves monitoring and managing your content's impact over time. So right now, rate yourself across these five dimensions on a scale of one to, ten, or one to five. Number one, we capture content usage data and monitor what target audiences and customers access, interact with, share, and distribute. Number two, we incorporate social listening and feedback into this monitoring to understand sentiment, advocacy, and amplification of our content themes and points of view. Number three, we measure our content marketing KPIs using real-time action-based metrics and processes. Number four, we assess content performance in channels and dial it up or down based on audience impact rather than financial or spending concerns. And five, we regularly measure, correlate, and report on our content, on how our content affects sales process, pipeline health, retention, and cross-sell upsell opportunities to determine its ROI. So again, rate your organization in each of the five areas on a one to five scale. Any competency for which you receive 30% or less of the possible points indicates that marketing leadership should develop a plan to address the weaknesses in that area. 
And if you earn 60% or more of the possible points in any competency, indicates it's a strength that marketing execs should maintain and replicate across the organization as resources and internal needs dictate. B2B marketing leaders are rethinking the delivery of digital experiences to meet the consumerized expectations of modern buyers. Rather than attempt to control the buying journey, marketers must meet buyers where they are in the buying process, anticipate their needs, and enable them to take the next step. The path to relevance is dynamic and self-directing. B2B, buy B2B buyers interact with sellers and determine what's meaningful or relevant through the lens of what they already know, the role they play in the decision process, insights from peers, and the collective experiences that precede consumption of a provider's content. Enabling B2B buyers requires the seller's alignment on common goals and a shift from selling at buyers through generic push messaging to helping buyers get the information they need in the moment to support their interaction intent and their decision-making journey. The pandemic reinforced how technology provides the economic, improves the economics and capabilities of every business. Using new digital capabilities, it's 10 times cheaper and faster to adapt your workforce, engage customers, create offerings, harness partners, and operate your business even among uncertainty. Digitally advanced firms embrace digital's new rules of business using technology at the core to create customer value. So now let's turn our attention to that technology. The technology on its own won't make, magically make you win. No different than owning free weights will make you magically physically fit. They're just an ingredient. They're just a means to achieve your goal. And that goal is your digital strategy. Start by understanding your customers and crafting journey maps that call out the digital interactions that are meaningful. Then score each of those digital interactions along two dimensions, the benefit to the customer and the value to your firm. Then prioritize those digital, digital interactions based on the scores. You can think of this as a stack rank backlog. Then select the right technology to bring those digital interactions to life. And more often than not, Taking a loosely coupled approach to the tech that powers those digital interactions will result in you having more flexibility. And that flexibility means you can deploy and iterate those digital interactions faster, with less cost, and with less technical complexity. Prioritize your moments based on customer benefit and business value. So your customer journey map will arm you with the specifics of each digital moment so that you can evaluate and prioritize your technology and process investments. So assess each moment according to two factors. The first factor is the customer benefit. And if, so if, if customers don't immediately benefit from a web or mobile moment, they'll avoid it or they'll move on to another activity. And this has always been true of the web and it's critical with mobile and next generation digital touch points. So use a simple rubric to prioritize moments that empower and reward customers. And the second is business value. Over the long haul, your company will invest in digital moments that reliably generate sales, save money, improve loyalty, or solve service problems. So for instance, IHG directs to investments in mobile moments based on success in in-room uh, nights booked. And the Home Depot validates investments by wayfinding technology with same store sales increases. So now let's look a little closer at how you need to think differently when you're working with modern technology. See, in the cloud, the, algebra, the traditional algebra of buy versus build doesn't work. And that's because of how modern software is written. So it turns out that pure buy doesn't exist and pure build also doesn't exist. The traditional build versus buy thinking underestimates the complexity and cost of packaged solutions as well as the value of platforms and their ecosystems. And it overestimates the cost and complexity of modern custom development, as well as the similarities between firms and a truly adaptable digital environment. In the digital era, software is an expression of the business. So how should we think about customized? Well, that's when you buy a thing and you need the inner workings of the thing to work differently in order to match how you do business. So with the car example, Honda Civics are popular with the tuner crowd because of how modifiable they are. 
Now, how to think about composing? Well, that's when you don't buy the mass manufactured discrete thing and then change the way it works. Instead, you assemble the thing from specialty parts by putting those parts together in a way that optimizes for what you are trying to achieve. And some parts you might even create yourself. And then you assemble those parts into the whole. Again, when you're composing, you're buying parts and assembling them into a thing. And the thing is your digital experience platform. So rather than a binary build versus buy choice, firms actually have a spectrum of delivery options. And they have for years. Now, excluding pure build, there are five, not just two, representing various combinations of purchase software and custom development. And new technologies, particularly cloud platforms and low-code tooling, new software design techniques like microservices and cloud native, new licensing like open source and pay-as-you-go APIs, and new development techniques like agile methods and continuous delivery drove this explosion in solution delivery options. And all of this evolution has driven massive changes to both packaged apps and custom development platforms. And this is the new reality of digital experiences. And it's why you need modern skills in order to take advantage of modern technology. And now with that, Jenny and I are going to do a little fireside chat to put this all into perspective. Yes. Uh, thank you, Joe. That was awesome. Uh, I, I feel like I learned so much every time I read your reports or certainly watch uh, your, you present. So thank you so much. And I hope the audience is it's getting just as much value from it. And I'm, I'm certain they are. Um, so yeah, so I did have some questions. Um, uh, I wanted to d dig in a little bit with you. Um, uh, uh, let's talk about the tech because you ended the presentation on the sort of technology pieces, the compose versus customize, build versus buy. Um, um, but I wanted to go back a little bit further, it, or, or, or like a little bit before in your presentation, you talked about personalization. Um, what are some ways when you're thinking about software technology for personalization specifically, what are some ways that these sort of machine learning powered methodologies can change the way the B2B buyer does business? Um, what, what kind of experiences do you hope that the hope that innovation and personalization starts to drive? Yeah, I think the ML is going to ingest a variety of signals in order to determine detent, intent. Um, and specifically, it'll understand intent and the role that person plays in the buying team. And in B2B buying, it's much more complex than in B2C because you have multiple people involved. They all have their own roles and responsibilities. Um, and some are going to be, uh, some, some are going to influence uh, they may influence on technical merit. They may influence on um, the economics. And so you're going to be speaking to a lot of different types of influencers. Um, and then, you know, I, I think this is going to make the buyer's self-directed research much more streamlined because the site will end up serving up that recommended content based on what it understands of the particular buying team member's intent and their relationship to other people in that buying group in the firm. And this is one of the things that I think sales reps do today, but you know, it's not exactly that consultative selling that we need them to focus on. And so as the tools are able to do that, um, this is just going to free up the, um, the sellers to be much more consultative as opposed to uh, you know, trying to sp spend a lot of time mapping out the power structure uh, on, the, on the buyer side. No, totally. I almost think about it. It's almost like a, it's almost like a, a little bit more complex of an example of like thinking about, let it, you know, giving agents more time on the customer service side by yeah. ensuring that you're using technology to empower people to self-serve. It feels a lot like that um, when you're talking about the B2B buying journey. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we know that B2B is obviously more complex because of this chain of buying power and these committees of buyers and the multiple steps and stakeholders um, that, you know, that B2B sort of employs versus B2C. Do you see the, like when it comes to e-commerce in particular, right? Like we know that there is this buying committee, you know, throughout kind of the B2B supply chain. Do you see the most opportunity in the relationship with the manufacturer um, and the distributor or the distributor and say the retailer? Yeah, that's... Um, when it when, comes when to these sort of e-commerce, omni-channel B2B sort of strategies. Yeah. Um... On the 
distributor side, you know, we expect that to remain strong. The, the, the forecast data tells us that distributors over the next five years are going to uh, nearly double um, the, the business that they're doing over oh, e-commerce. Wow. So today it's 1.2 trillion. In five years, it's, it's gonna be uh, 2 trillion. On the manufacturer side, they're going to be going from 656 billion uh, in 2021 to over a trillion in 2027. So they're, they're still big numbers, uh, but the um, the the bulk of the money is tr- being transacted through the through the set of distributors. And there's a little bit that's going to be that uh, or relatively smaller amount that's being transacted through what the report calls non-merchant um, e-commerce, which is it's basically like um, marketplaces with third-party sellers that they, you know, you may buy it through that marketplace, but they never take title of the goods, and the the revenue that they make is, you know, commission. But the the, the GMV, it's about one percent of the total take right now. Oh wow! You know, our gut says that's probably underreported right now because when you look at the data, you could have you could have one uh, distributor. Uh, who is reporting their data as a distributor, but they may have um, some of their product assortment as third-party sellers. So we think that this is a little bit of a dark market. Sure. Um, but the oppor- but but it's certainly showing tremendous growth. Even that one percent growth is going from seventeen billion to thirty-eight billion uh, yeah. in twenty twenty-seven. Wow. Well, let's talk about marketplaces then for a second. Like. I, I did. I think I. I don't know if it was in a conversation with you or you know doing some sort of research ahead of this webinar. But uh, Amazon had a B two B marketplace that like kind of nobody really knew about, and then during the pandemic, it just exploded and it really shocked the market. And I think it shocked Amazon a little bit too, from what I was reading. Um, and so, uh, how how do you think other marketplace B two B entrants like? How, how can other sort of B2B marketplace entrants compete with Amazon? Because now everyone's so accustomed to buying Amazon. And where do you see that, that proliferation kind of succeeding? Yeah, so the thing, and we'll call out um, Amazon business. So it's, it's essentially a lightweight e-procurement platform, um, but it's sure. general purpose. And it's, it's not specialized to the needs of any one industry. In, in fact, um, it's really aimed at uh, what's called tail spend. So MRO, um, the, the, uh, the types of unplanned ad hoc purchases. Um, but again, it's, it's not industry specific. And so let's take an example of if you and I are going to, um, if, if, if we have to buy chemicals, um, that requires much more specialized buying Mm -hmm. experiences. And so there's an opportunity, um, well, because chemicals is so highly regulated, you've got, um, and it's regulated differently in different jurisdictions, different regions. Um, and so a chemical marketplace would uh, be able to drive efficiencies by having, for instance, one customer onboarding process that establishes all of the rules of who can buy what, where, and what licenses are required. And the efficiency that would drive is, as a buyer, I can I can onboard to that marketplace and provide all my credentials and uh, you know only see the stuff that I'm allowed to buy. And that's different than all the pain that as a buyer, I would have to onboard to each individual supplier. And it also uh, would alleviate the pain of all the individual suppliers having to onboard us. And so there's mm-hmm. a lot of process efficiencies that marketplaces can can bring to bear. Uh, when they're when they're industry specific, right, right. That's that's it's the specialization. That's kind of right. I, I like that because it offers an opportunity. It offers a marketplace opportunity, and it offers like, proliferation in the space. Doesn't let Amazon just eat everybody's lunch. <laughs> um, it, you talk. It, it's you hard talk for a- Amazon. It's hard for Amazon to go niche. That's yes, one thing that we've noticed. You know, it's one thing to sell. Um, you know, MR, mop buckets and, and, and toilet paper, but the really niche stuff, uh, we haven't really seen Amazon be able to to crush lots of niches at scale. Yeah, yeah. Marketplace, B2B marketplaces are like 
yeah, the podcasts of e-commerce. <laughs> they succeed <laughs> when they're each. <laughs> That's so great. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so you talk, so we talk a lot about like part, one of the things that makes our platform um, sophisticated is that, you know, when we work even with B2C retailers, um, we oftentimes, you know, we service a lot of branded content as search results. If that's something that the, our, our, our customer wants to be part of the search experience or the shopping experience, mm -hmm. I think obviously that has even more important opportunity on the B2C side, because it would allow you to, per, to sort of surface all of the kind of content that show that, you know, because the buying journeys are so much longer, um, things like that. Um, is there, do you, so any we search there's a big opportunity for search to surface all of that sort of product detail information and documentation about these products that you're buying in, in, in B2B. You talked a lot about sort of surfacing kind of marketing information and content data to the omni-channel sellers. Do you think that search could have, you know, search insights could provide the same value to those omni-channel sellers to sort of improve the buyer journey? Oh, a hundred percent. You know, the search is, is where search is where all of this intent gets, you know, ingested uh, because you're getting it from, you're getting signals uh, from the search, you know, from the search bar itself. Mm -hmm. You're understanding what happens after that uh, click through the search results. Uh, and um, the, uh, there, there are multiple signals that the search can ingest. And so um, just like you can provide relevant search results, you can do that with content recommendations that, you know, don't necessarily come back as a big, you know, ordered list. It could be just the, you know, the, the, the single, um, uh, uh, the single tile or whatnot. So I, I think, I think, search is where it's going to be for um, providing all of those uh, all of those uh, rec thoughtful recommendations at the right time relevant uh, to where where buyers are along their journey sure. um, I don't I don't know that there's a, another uh, part of the tech stack that is currently developed to the point to be able to do that just because search has been doing it um, uh, for so long. True. We, we know that all too well. <laughs> um, we only have three minutes here. Um, so um, I'm going to ask one more question. I have like a long list here, so I'm going to try to cherry pick as best as I can. Um, um, so... So I actually, I keep, I'm going to go back a little bit to personalization because I think it's so important and I find it to be so interesting um, that it's as important in this ecosystem as it would be say in B2C. Um, what roadblocks do you see the organizations that you work with deal with the most when it comes to deploying personalization? Like how do you think they could move the boulders and firm up um, and firm up their strategy to sort of execute the right kind of personalization? It requires um, multiple stakeholders to be aligned. So when you're in an organization, you know personalization is not just one department. All departments have to um, pitch into it. So a couple a couple things. Um, uh, your personalization initiatives should focus on customer value and not what uh, you want to sell. Uh, and so brands. You know, have to accomplish both goals, and to do that by ensuring that they don't act at you know opposing or cross purposes to their customers. Um, all customer-facing roles have to contribute to personalization. So the transformation there to deliver great CX absolutely goes beyond tech, which is how it can be um, one of the roadblocks. It can be counterintuitive that it, it takes. Uh, tech to pull this off, but there's a whole bunch of non-tech work that you have to do. So your yeah. brand execs have to find ways to improve cooperation across lines of business. Yeah. Um, you know, 45% of CX professionals indicated that the biggest obstacle to improving CX is their firm's lack of cooperation across teams. Mm. Teamwork is... makes the dream work. Yeah, the, yes. <laughs> the personalization dream work as well. Um, yes. 
that's ex- I mean aligning data within the organization like that's it's it's a it's a human appro- it's a human strategy not a tech problem you know a hundred percent we see that all the time in, in 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 our customer organizations as well um, well Joe we we have some people asking questions in the chat but um, we like to sort of generally keep these at forty five minutes so I do promise to respond to everybody that asked a question in the question bar um, I saw quite a few come in so we'll follow up with over email with those folks. Um, and we'll make sure that we get your question answered. There was some good stuff in there. Um, and I'll share them with you, Joe, as well. Um, and so thank you. This was amazing. I really appreciate your time, Joe. I had a great time. I love this topic. Um, and I, I feel like I learned so, so much today. So thank you, thank you. Yeah, thanks great. for having and me. And thank you, Jenny and Joe. Uh, as Jenny <laughs> mentioned, that's all the time we have for today. Within the next 24 hours, you will receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation, so you can view it on demand or share with your peers or colleagues. Uh, please feel free to invite, invite those in the industry that might benefit from the content today to watch this event. Thank you both, and have a great day. Thanks, everyone.